a finale that negated nine seasons of storytelling. A superhero undone by beer. The most dramatic haircut ever seen on teen TV. Even the most celebrated shows can miss the mark, but these disastrous episodes nearly tanked their entire series. After a critically acclaimed debut season, Friday Night Lights kicked off with season two with an underwhelming premiere. When Landry whacks Tyra's creepy attacker with a pipe and dumps his body in a river, a respectable show depicting an otherwise nuanced and realistic depiction of Texas life turned into an over-the-top melodrama for two of its characters. Actors Jesse Plemons and Adrienne Palicki do a decent enough job with the material, but this bizarre subplot belongs in another show. If we wanted to see this kind of death and a slowly unraveling cover-up, we would have tuned into a soap opera. The killing of the random stalker guy screamed network interference and distracted viewers from the other parts of the story. Who cares that Coach Taylor has to end his paternity leave or that Julie feels hemmed in by her first serious relationship when there's a dead body in the river? Friday Night Lights would eventually resolve the subplot with relatively little consequence and go on to earn its place in our hearts. But season two opener, Last Days of Summer, remains its low point. In retrospect, Battlestar Galactica would have been even better if it hadn't committed to the old model of the 22-episode season, as it tended to have a couple of random filler episodes each year. No episode is more skippable than Season 2's Black Market, which seems like a classic case of writers trying to fit a square peg into a round hole. The episode is about an investigation into an off-book black market that's supposedly impossible to corral. When Commander Fisk is found dead, Captain Apollo begins digging and discovers that Fisk was involved in the black market. After nearly 30 episodes of the show, we learn that Apollo has a long-lost love from back home that he's never once mentioned, and a relationship with a sex worker that he regularly sees in the fleet despite his tension with Starbuck. At the end of the episode, after killing a couple of gangsters, he allows the rest of the villains to keep doing their black market thing so long as they stop killing ship commanders and trafficking humans. So you're still in business. For now. It's a thoroughly nonsensical episode, one so bad that Battlestar Galactica had to pull out all the stops with the brilliant season-ending time jump on New Caprica to make us forget it. Stranger Things is lucky that it came out in the era of streaming. If fans had been forced to wait an entire week after the season 2 episode The Lost Sister, they might have revolted. Every season of Stranger Things has replicated the formula of the first with varying degrees of success. Co-creators Matt and Ross Duffer are pros at stretching a feature film-worthy adventure into eight or nine hours of television. By episode seven, we're usually hurtling towards some big confrontation, but the lost sister halted that momentum to follow Eleven on a standalone side quest to Chicago to reconnect with another experimentee from her past. Sister. Sister. She ends up with slightly enhanced powers and a cool new goth vibe, but not much else of relevance happens. It's a complete wrench in what was a well-oiled, binge-worthy machine of a show. In a world where Stranger Things aired weekly on cable, fans would have spent seven long days seething. Luckily, all they had to do was take a deep breath and let Netflix play Episode 8 automatically. NBC's ER was once the epitome of prestige network drama. It was a serious, gripping portrayal of the passionate people saving lives in a Chicago emergency room. While it dabbled in the occasional rating stunt with plot lines involving escaped convicts, serial killers, or George Clooney rescuing a kid trapped in a storm drain, it generally aimed for a realistic, grounded sense of what life working in a hospital would be like. As the years went on, the cast changed and the writers needed to up the ante. In the season 10 episode Freefall, Dr. Romano is crushed by a falling helicopter in an impossibly slow scene with hilariously bad CGI, even for 2003. This came after Dr. Romano had an arm cut off by a helicopter rotor in the previous season. ER would run for 15 seasons in total, so Freefall didn't outright ruin it. However, the helicopter sequence did make the show much more difficult to take seriously from that point on. In truth, any episode from Community Season 4 would be right at home on this list. Creator Dan Harmon got forced out by NBC after Season 3, but the show continued for an entire season before he got reinstated. It retained most of the writing staff, but they took the show in a lighter, safer direction, and it was terrible. 
Intro to Felt Surrogacy, an episode that utilized puppets of the main cast, felt like a pale imitation of the claymation episode from season two, Abed's Uncontrollable Christmas. Another low point was Heroic Origins, in which Abed discovers the group had all crossed paths before meeting at Greendale, essentially retconning the pilot episode. These aren't plot holes, Abed. This is my life. But this kind of connection only makes our origin story more compelling. The lowest low point was Economics of Marine Biology, the poorest rated community episode on IMDb with a score of just 6.7. It centers around the college getting ready to woo a potential new student with lots of money. Den of Geek observed that this episode's plotline was incredibly formulaic, which makes for very bland television. Even by the standards of Lost's notoriously convoluted season 3, Stranger in a Strange Land might be the most inconsequential, pointless episode of the show. Some mildly gripping nonsense with the others happens on the island, while the flashbacks clue viewers in on a mystery nobody was wondering about. What is the meaning behind Jack's terrible tattoos? In a painfully pointless series of events, Jack has a brief fling with a mysterious tattoo artist in Thailand and then gets beaten up. In the present, we learn that his ink translates to... He walks amongst us, but he is not one of us. Your tattoos, that's what they say. The wording is parallel to how the Bible describes Jesus as in the world, but not of the world. However, the writers leave it unclear as to whether the tattoo has a similarly spiritual meaning or if the tattoo artist just marked Jack as a tourist. Either way, Stranger in a Strange Land is an hour that even the biggest Lost fans wanted back. After nine years, How I Met Your Mother delivered a polarizing finale. While it was clear that future Ted telling a rambling story to his children was just a fun framework for the show, it didn't mean that fans weren't invested in the resolution of Ted and Tracy's relationship. The showrunners underestimated how much ire the finale would generate by killing off the mother minutes after she and Ted finally meet, only to pawn future Ted off on the still magically single Robin. The point of the story is that, is that you totally, totally, totally have the hots for Aunt Robin. Whether or not it was planned all along, it turned what should have been a perfect landing from a beloved show into a bewildering reframing of the entire story. How I Met Your Mother hasn't enjoyed the resurgence in popularity that other staples like Friends and The Office have on streaming services, but the Hulu spin-off How I Met Your Father proves that its legacy nonetheless survived the hit. Even the most beloved shows have episodes that fans always tend to skip, and The Great Divide is the ultimate proof of that. This much derided episode of Avatar The Last Airbender suffers from being an entirely parenthetical entry with no relevance to any serial plot as two bickering clans argue about how to cross a vast canyon. These tribes were never featured in the main story before this episode, and they were never seen again, making the whole plotline a waste of time for both the showrunners and viewers. As if to try and justify the episode's existence, our heroes get caught up in this petty drama and start acting out of character in ways that shoehorn moral lessons into a show that's otherwise known for restraint and subtlety. Aang resorts to deception, while Katara and Sokka each sympathize with a separate tribe. The Great Divide seems like it was written by someone who hadn't seen the rest of the show, and the fans continue to unite in critiquing it. Beloved as it is, Buffy the Vampire Slayer isn't a show famed for its consistency. It often relied on Monster of the Week-style episodes that were self-contained and not connected to each season's big bad, meaning it would usually have a few duds per year. Season 4's Beer Bad comes across more like an after-school special about the dangers of alcohol than a fun installment of the classic urban fantasy series. An enchanted beer causes Buffy to devolve into a primal, urge-based version of herself. Want more singing? Want more beer? In her enchantedly drunken state, Buffy starts to draw cave paintings on her dorm room wall. This is all supposedly meant to illustrate how upset Buffy is about being dumped by some jerk. The story ends abruptly, without any consequences for the bartender that drugged a bunch of teenagers with magic beer. Beer Bad is bad TV, pure and simple. The first season of Parks and Recreation is nothing like the rest of the show. The main character, Amy Poehler's Leslie Nope, was essentially an even more boorish and awkward version of Michael Scott from The Office, which it was clearly trying to imitate. The show had only a distant echo of the earnestness it would come to be known for, and if it had been cancelled before season two, nobody would have batted an eyelid. 
Rock Show, the final episode of season one, veered into slapstick territory. Mark gets rejected by a very angry Anne, then makes a drunken attempt to kiss Leslie before falling into a pit. It's a weird and cringe-worthy end to a season that hits all the wrong notes and could easily have been the last straw for the series. NBC, of course, gave it another shot, and the subsequent six seasons will live in the hearts of viewers forever. Most millennials remember Felicity, a show about the college life of Carrie Russell's curly-haired, eponymous character. They also likely remember that in the season two episode, The List, Felicity cut her famous hair on a whim, causing shock and outrage in equal measure. Felicity's famous locks were part of her character, and when she said goodbye to them, some fans said goodbye to the show, seeing it as the end of a chapter. What got lost in the reaction to Felicity's pixie cut is that a sudden dramatic haircut is a pretty reasonable reaction to a breakup like the one she has with Ben in the same episode. Thankfully, Felicity survived the dramatic haircut and went on to detail all four years of our heroine's college experience. The final season would end with a multi-episode time travel arc that's far more unique and memorable than the close-up snipping of some scissors. Check out one of our newest videos right here. Plus, even more Looper videos about your favorite shows are coming soon. Subscribe to our YouTube channel and hit the bell so you don't miss a single one.